Grow CFO is where finance leaders grow together. Join thousands of like-minded professionals using Grow CFO to access the combined knowledge and experience of the finance leader community. You can join us today at growcfo.net. Hello and welcome to the Grow CFO show. I'm your host Kevin Appleby, and today we're going to talk about an area of fundraising we've never covered on the show before, that the idea of legal fundraising. And who better to have with us to talk about that than the CFO of a legal finance company, Jordan Leach from Burford Capital. Welcome to the Grow CFO show. Kevin, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Jordan, how did you become CFO at Burford Capital? Great question. I won't start at the very beginning and bore you with all my history, but I was a advisor for 15 years, both a consultant and an investment banker. And at some point I decided it was time to eat my own cooking as opposed to just always giving advice. And about seven or eight years ago, I had actually left investment banking and went to a client in the mortgage industry, had a variety of different roles. And then I ended up leaving after selling that company and ended up at Burford. To make a long story short there, though, the interesting thing is my boss when I was at Morgan Stanley was Jim Kilman. And I had always said I was one day going to take my boss's job. I assumed it would have been an investment banking and it ended up turning out actually to be here at Burford after a variety of career turns for himself. He actually ended up here as CFO a couple of years ago, and then that's how we made the connection. And that's how I ended up here. And now I'm looking back across my own career and people that I knew 20, maybe 30 years ago and possibly not seen for 25 years suddenly there becomes a reason to talk to them, a reason to work together again. So always keep friends with that network. It's so important. You're absolutely right. He's been both a boss, a friend, and a mentor. And we'd always stayed in touch through the years. And who would have thought seven years after leaving Morgan Stanley and probably 10 years after him leaving Morgan Stanley that I would end up at Burford. But Yeah. So before you were at Burford, though, you were the CFO in your last role. You were doing a COO role. Yeah, I had a really fortunate career. I was at a residential mortgage company in, actually, in Dallas. We were a national lender. And I took a variety of different turns. At one point, I was actually helping to run the sales organization. And then I had strategy roles, and then I was most recently, as you mentioned, that after we sold the company, the chief operating officer of the combined mortgage company, and took that through integration. I never grew up necessarily saying, hey, I want to be this title or that title. I think my focus has was always been, I just like working with smart teams and smart people and solving hard problems. But what has been most interesting for my role now is that I understand this concept of when people say the business, and I can't stand that con the business versus the back office and so forth. Well, actually, we're all doing the business. We're just doing it from a different angle. And I have learned a lot and appreciate what it takes to actually run the operations and the dependencies that those teams have on the finance organization, the partnerships with FP&A or accounting, and whether it's around understanding actuals or forecasting and the real symbiotic relationship that the two have. So it served me well in my current seat. Yeah. So certainly the experience that you've had that's much, much wider than doing the current finance role, is that something you would recommend that every CFO should try and get? Listen, there's, well, I think the CFO role is getting stretched in a lot of different ways. I know you've probably talked about that on other podcasts and getting pulled into strategy decisions or operational decisions. I think that having a true understanding of whatever the product or service that you're delivering and the how and the why, having to have to do a sales call to sell what the product, having to execute on front-end deliverables with respect to technology. That's all been great learning ground for what I need to do as a CFO and, and how to be a great partner. And finding a way to get that experience or just to being a partner is essential to sitting in this seat. Yeah. So, Jordan, Burford Capital. What does Burford Capital actually do? Well, sure. Uh, appreciate it. So, look, 
at the end of the day, Burford Capital, we're investors and we invest in litigation finance. And when you say, well, well, what does that mean? Well, first, let me focus on we're in the commercial side of the world, so not consumer. So don't think slip and fall or 1-800 advertisements on the side of the highway for an attorney. These are large commercial disputes, whether it's a contract dispute or a patent dispute or international arbitration in which one party has been harmed and is uh, looking to um, litigate against uh, a defendant. What we do is very simple. We invest in that case. And the way we do it is in an extremely advantageous way for our clients. Think about it this way. If you're a CFO and you're looking at your budget for 2024 and you see expenses going out the door, five or 10 million on litigation expense, that's a run rate cost that's running through the income statement. And that's expensive. Ultimately, you'll have a one-time event and hopefully you win and maybe you'll see the proceeds of that case. And that case maybe produces a 50 or $60 million item. And that's a one-time event that will never roll through the PL. All your analysts or your owners, you don't have to be public to use litigation finance, will look at it as a one-time event. It drops out of the bottom line. And so when you think about it, you've been hit on both sides. And what we do is we come in and we say, well, let us, we'll underwrite the case. And when we feel comfortable, let us take that on. We'll take on the expenses associated with it. And then we'll partake in the ultimate success or the ultimate failure. It's not a loan. And so if the case doesn't win, we don't win. It's and in, it's as simple as that. There are two parties, or sometimes more than two parties in every case. There can only be one winner. That's usually the case, yes. Yeah. So, But by that, we're not debt on your balance sheet. We win with our clients, and we lose our capital when the case loses. Okay, makes sense. And I can see in some litigations, particularly if you're a perhaps a, a smaller company, coming up like a, against a big giant like say an apple or a microsoft or sort of somebody of that size a company that's got almost infinite resources that can fight anything then you've got i suppose two choices you've got choice one can't afford this litigation walk away from it even though we've got a good case or choice two go invest a lot of the company's money that should be there for other purposes, your to to defend the litigation or to litigate against the big company, you're taking a lot of money away from other plans in the business. Yeah, Kevin, you're spot on. I think that is one of the use cases that one can think about, which is you don't necessarily even, it's not just about reducing your OPEX, but you might not actually even have the cash to spend. Exactly. And so there's definitely, in the example that you just described, there's no question that one of the tactics that a defendant wants to use is a delay tactic. And how long can I make the case last? And can I outspend the other party to make it frustrating to come to conclusion? And so obviously having a third party capital there to support the case. But I don't want to make it just about David versus Goliath. We can also help those with access to capital. At the end of the day, this product is one in which when you're the CFO and you're thinking through where should I be allocating resources, you can look at this the same way you look at the ROI of building the next factory or research and development or hiring the incremental workforce. And those types of ROI investments deserve the marginal dollar and that's core and reoccurring to your business model, whereas this litigation most likely isn't. We're not owning the case. We're passive investors, but we are active in our advice. We can participate with you on legal strategy and in terms of how to think through the various phases of litigation as well as potentially ultimate settlement. But I don't want people to think that we're going to take over the case and actually run it. What we're doing is we're investing in it. Obviously, we have lawyers on staff, but there's still a set of outside attorneys that are going to be pursuing the litigation. I guess if a 
company comes to you and says, we've got this litigation, will you finance it? Then in the same way as any normal fundraise, where you're looking for somebody to come along and invest in the business, then you're going to put a business case towards that funder that says, hey, you should fund because we think we've got a high probability of winning this case. And I guess you're not going to invest in just any case. You're going to want to know that you've got a reasonable chance of getting your money back. Yeah. Look, we have 55 lawyers on staff across the globe, and we're going to do a full underwrite of the case. At the end of the day, though, we are investment professionals as well. So it's not just right about being right on the law, but we're putting a significant amount of capital out. And when we do that, we do need to get a return for our shareholders. And so you're absolutely right. We're not looking for adverse selection, which is send us all your lottery tickets. We are going to spend the time and underwrite. But I think what we'll also do, given our 15-year track record, is work with clients to understand the realities of either that particular case or a portfolio of cases. In many cases, our clients have more than one one potential piece of litigation and we can partner with them across their portfolio of assets. Yeah. I guess there's always going to be some uncertainty because say if it was black and white, it wouldn't be going to court in the first place. That's correct. And obviously some cases are easier than others and it's not just an interpretation of the events, but it's also then an interpretation of what the damages are and then how the law applies to it. And so there is a significant amount of underwriting that needs to get done. So what sort of win rate have you got? Well, I don't mind saying we're pretty good at it. Over the course of our history, one thing I, I'm not sure that everyone necessarily understands, and I promise to answer the question, is that when you think about wins and losses, the majority of cases actually go to settlement. When you look at, you now, obviously, I think what you were winning is, are we getting our money back? And we do have a historical IRR of around 27% on these cases. Almost 75%, though, of our cases end up ultimately settling. About 18-ish percent end up actually going to the final stage, and it's an adjudicated win. And then there's an about 8 or 9% that ends up in adjudicated loss. Yeah. So looking at it that way, if in the vast majority of cases there's going to be a settlement, you're probably on pretty steady ground for getting your money back. Yeah. One of the harder things, though, in this is actually estimating duration. And so what's interesting about this business model or the asset class is that there's a very defined path around litigation of how it will end, meaning you know the sequence of events in the litigation. Mm -hmm. What you don't know is actually, though, the duration of each stage. And we have a cost of capital, right? Just like everyone else does. And that duration, while can be estimated up front, is widely variable. And of course, given settlements, settlements can happen at any point in time, usually around events. It gets hard to estimate when that return is going to occur. But that's part of the reason why having a partner to help finance that along the way is one of the use cases and why our clients like working with us. Yeah. So Jordan, just to clarify this in my mind, walk me through an example. Say I'm CFO in a company that's got a litigation. I'm looking at possibly needing $10 million. Sure. I come along and say, Burford, can you give me, uh, can you underwrite this $10 million, please? How does the, the cash flow sequence work? Yeah. So there's two different ways that we can partner together. So the first thing is you look at that and that 10 million drag on your earnings. What we'll, we could do multiple ways. So the first thing is obviously we're going to underwrite the case. So let's skip over the fact that we've done our diligence and we've modeled it out. What we would do is we'd partner with you and we would pay the lawyers that you selected along the way, meaning we're going to help manage that process. We'll pay the budget right? And pay those fees over time as they're incurred. But you don't um, actually give me as the CFO the money. You well, we can. Directly. 
We can actually, like depending on the type of case and the underwrite and how we feel about it, there are times where we have done a monetization in yeah. which in this example, let's say it's $10 million to win a hundred. We can give you maybe the, we'll pay the fees along the way and maybe we'll give you an extra 10 to boot. Obviously, we're going to look for a larger piece of the pie upon conclusion because we'll have put more capital out. But we have the ability to do both depending on the underwrite to both pay fees or actually help monetize the ultimate reward. Yeah. So let's say it's, it is 10 million and yep. the outcome could be 100 million positive to us. What sort of percentage of that 100 million would you be expecting to take? Yeah, so look, I think raw if you take a step back and you think about where this business originally came from is contingency fees in which lawyers take. And so obviously attorneys can take this contingency and they've historically done around a third. And so I think that's a good analogy in terms of how to think about our fee. Now one might say listening to this, why don't I just Put it on contingency with the law firm. The fact is not every law firm wants to take every case on contingency or they, in some cases, law firms might have multiple cases. We partner with law firms as well as corporate clients. We might partner with a law firm in which they'll back end share some of the contingency to get some fees along the way. And this is an opportunity in which we'll pay those fees. And I think you should think about the outcome the same way you think about contingency fees. Yeah, okay. Understand. And I can see as a CFO the benefits of getting the service in, as we've talked about already. Can I afford to pay this money? Possibly. Well, not just afford the money. Look, I think about it also in a valuation for public companies. It's pretty simple. Let's just pretend you're valued at 10 times EBITDA. Yeah. You don't have an analyst that's going through and saying, oh, I'll take this $10 million out. So you've now had a $100 million hit to your earnings or to your valuation when you think about that $10 million running through OpEx. When that $100 million win that you just talked about comes in, no one put that into value. That dropped into the bottom line. It doesn't show up in the multiples. And so you're kind of getting hit on both sides. There's an opportunity for us to help. But I also think it's also about risk sharing and risk mitigation. This is an opportunity to partner with a firm that has a 15-year track record. We manage a $7 billion portfolio. We're probably one of the largest, if not the largest, spender on legal fees than the globe annually. And so when you think about that, we have a lot of insight. As I mentioned before, we're passive, but we can be active in our advice should you choose to use it. We can help you think about the strategy and help you manage your attorneys and think through the right. We can read briefs and think through the right way to try the case, and you can get the benefit of our experience. That comes for free with our capital. Right. So, Jordan, what about your role? Your role as CFO in the organization. What does a CFO in an organization like yours do? Who doesn't like talking about themselves? Obviously, there's the traditional CFO role of just running the trains. So in my role as a public company, we have quarterly and annual earnings, right? So investor relations and getting the numbers out. I sit on the investment committee. And so participating in the decision process around investments, we manage some third-party funds as well. I think, but most importantly, I think my role is a partner to the rest of the business. I sit in a great seat where everyone else is a lawyer and I'm not. And so I come at whether it's strategy or HR or technology or finance or investing very separate from the rest of our management team given my consulting and investment banking background. And so I definitely enjoy that, just being kind of the outsider coming in who never went to three years of law school. I feel bad for our general counsel because it's very difficult to be general counsel in a firm where everyone else also is an attorney. It's a little bit easier to be CFO where everyone else went to training at a law school. Those lawyers, how good do you think they are at business? So it's interesting. It was one of probably my first worries about coming to the firm. Was this going to be a 
law firm culture. Nothing wrong with law firms. In fact, my entire family is attorneys. So my mother, my father, stepmother, stepfather, my brother, and, and so on. I'm the black sheep in the family that decided to go into investment banking. But I'm used to being around it. But I didn't necessarily want to go to a law firm culture. I think I started off by saying that this is an investment firm first. They might not have been trained in Excel to start. But I think that's part of our culture of understanding numbers and understanding investments and understanding how that plays itself out in law and in the case. And so I think we've got a good group of people. I don't want to say that they're a dime a dozen. I think we've nurtured a culture here and, and invested in time and, and kind of building out this skill set. So culture, that's always a very interesting question. So how do you build that right culture? that isn't a law firm culture, that is an investment firm culture? Yeah. So look, I think some of it starts off with just mimicking some of the processes that exist in kind of traditional investment management. So we act the same way that a PE firm would or a, a VC firm in which there's a commitments committee or an investment committee that's we're building models and memos and underwriting the same way that someone in my experience, I've spent a lot of time with those comparables the same way that something would get presented for investment around looking at a private equity event. And so I think that's one of the ways where you can steal from your peers. I think it also is driven from the top down or founder led and both are CIO and CEO have been in this business for over 15 years. And so I think some of that has bled its way through into training the folks around us. And then next thing you know, it's just part of our DNA. One of the things we look for, though, when hiring an attorney is not someone who's actually looking to bill by the hour. And they have to have an interest and a desire to think about kind of investment along these bill lines. Bill by the hour? Uh, I was sitting the other day at dinner table with a lawyer here in the UK, and I said, so I guess you bill by every 15 minutes. Uh, no, every six. Can every we? six minutes, yes. My mother's an attorney. I don't know if it's fair to say this. You might edit this joke out. As my mother told me when I was thinking about going to law school, she said, there's more fun ways to get paid by the hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really don't like that idea of having to account for every six minutes in every yeah. working day. That's my idea of hell. <laughs> right. Well, look, and that's one of the advantages that having us as a partner also bring. We can shed light on what we think it should cost for different phases. What should it cost for a discovery phase? What should it cost for the initial trial? What should it cost for a potential appeal? And how many partners should be on the case? And we work really well with a number of law firms across the globe. And I think we have great working relationships, and we have to, given our history. But our clients can also benefit from us kind of helping them and guide them through that process. Yeah, your clients, Jordan, we talk clients in terms of the businesses that you help. But yep. the client, is the individual that you're dealing with these businesses mostly the CFO? Unfortunately not. It tends to... So look, it's always a three-ring circus. First of all, there's always a law firm and there's always a client. And yeah. so in many cases, well, we might have partnered directly with the client or we could have partnered with the law firm. But when you ask about the client side, we tend to engage first with the general counsel. And that makes sense for a number of reasons. I think this is a tool that the CFO should actually completely understand. The same way in which I sit here and I need to understand the different expenditures that we have in technology on my CRM system or my ERP system and making sure that I understand what those costs are is the same way in which a CFO should understand the costs that are happening in the general counsel's remit. And I think that there is an opportunity to then use a tool set, just like I might make a decision to outsource or finance real estate or outsource the technology and use a partner. I can think about that same concept when it comes to how should I provide capital towards this asset. And it is an asset just because it's not on your balance sheet, because GAP or IFRS might not tell you to put it on your balance sheet. It is a valuable thing, this potential future reward. And how should we address that? 
So I think one of the things we're focused on is trying to get out to more CFOs. And Kevin, this is a great opportunity for us to do that sales pitch. Yeah. So Jordan, you're clearly operating out of the USA. Is this a US business or is this a global business? It's a global business. We have, obviously, I'm in New York and that's where some our main office is. We have a large office in London, another one in Chicago, but then we have presence in around a dozen other countries and around the globe. Our clients are global. The litigation can be global. Law firms are global. And so we have the ability to look at assets anywhere and have done so over the course of many years. Yeah. So we talk about what you do as a CFO, Jordan. Sitting beneath you, what sort of size finance team do you have? We're actually only about 170-ish professionals overall in the firm. And I don't know the numbers perfectly. I'd say our finance department is probably around 25 or so folks when we think about accounts payable and treasury and you know investor relations and tax and the likes. I also happen to manage our HR and our technology functions and some of the other operations here. And that stems back from, you had already mentioned my COO days. It's far different from residential mortgage when I had several thousand people. This is obviously a, yeah, a little I, bit smaller I guess the, the difference when you look at residential mortgage, you're looking at a lot more deals for a lot smaller value. Yeah. Every deal is different. We can structure every deal differently. And they're all going to be unique. But what I think is valuable around us is every snowflake is different. We've seen a lot of them. And given the fact that we have 15 years of track record, and as I mentioned before, a $7 billion portfolio of assets, as we've seen a lot of cases. Yeah. So they just talk about $7 billion portfolio. So you must have a lot of investors in your own organization. So tell me a little bit about how Burford finds its capital to invest. Yeah. So we went public actually in London about 14 or 15 years ago and came to the New York Stock Exchange about four years ago. And so we are publicly traded. And so just like every other public company out there doing quarterly and annual earnings calls, and I'm on the road spending time with whether it's different types of investors across the globe. And then we also manage some third-party funds. We have an asset management business that we do the same thing that has some of these assets in it. We've used third-party debt. So here in the US, the 144A capital markets. And so we've got $1.8 billion of debt outstanding. And so I've gone to the high yield market a couple of times to raise that capital. Yeah. You've got a big part of your role is looking after the funding of your own company. No, there's no question. I think, yeah, I think managing our capital stack and making sure that we're putting our money to work and managing those assets and making sure the capital and liquidity is here. This is a growing business and one in which we continue to see more and more usage of the product. Over the last couple of years, we've had two Fortune 50 companies so that, like we said, it's not just David versus Goliath. We've had two Fortune 50 companies look to use our services. We partnered well with them, and I expect that to continue. And there's no reason why we can't get the next 48, but that means we're going to have to have access to capital and be able to put that capital to work. Brilliant. Jordan, this is just such a fascinating area that I've never had any exposure to before. I know very little about litigation, know very little about litigation finance. And just thank you for enlightening me and I guess many people in our audience. Well, Kevin, I appreciate it. And I appreciate the opportunity. We try and demystify it. At the end of the day, it's unfortunate that disputes can occur. But when they do, that does have value to you. And that's a value that you should look to extract, um, but you might not have the capital or it might not be the best use of your capital at that point in time. And we'd love to partner with you. Jordan Leach, thank you for being this week's guest on the Grow CFO Show. Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm.